It is an interesting question. What is wrong with mindfulness? Uh, of course, that begs the question, is there anything wrong with mindfulness? Most people would certainly say no, because these days mindfulness is nearly always associated with that which is good, skillful, useful, beneficial, healthy, and it's being taught by people from all traditions, whether it's a spiritual tradition, whether it's a health-based um, practice in order to cultivate good mental health, whether it's for relaxation, whether it's for better interpersonal relationships, and even for better sexual relationships. So it's being taught by everyone for everything. And because it is so widely taught and so widely used, I do believe that often there may be some slight differences of understanding about what mindfulness is. I'm not here to criticize anybody else's practice or way of teaching mindfulness or practicing mindfulness. It is purely my interest to explore with you what I have reflected on mindfulness, what it is, how it is used, how it can be used, pitfalls with regards to mindfulness, and the purpose of mindfulness from the Buddhist tradition, because that's my personal background and passion. Recently, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh passed away, a great loss to the world. He was a great meditation master, a wonderful human being, a tremendous inspiration for not only the Buddhist community around the world, but I think society and people of all faiths. Through his teachings and practice, the practice of mindfulness, I think, became much better known in the West, certainly in America. I remember when I first came across Buddhism in Thailand, one of the uh, earliest books that I can remember reading was a very small booklet, Mindfulness in Every Step by Thich Nhat Hanh. And I found that to be quite uplifting and inspiring. And I remember it to this day. Of course, he wrote many books, all of them wonderful. And I remember that teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh. A few years or many years later, I had the good fortune of meeting him myself, which was an honor. Because recently I was speaking to a disciple of his. And this disciple had trained under Thich Nhat Hanh and was also a teacher, is still a teacher. And he was relating to me a story, uh, an encounter during a a retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh when there was a group of, quite a large group of students and um, sitting and Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh was standing much as I am on the stage and he looked around and of course mindfulness is the main theme of his teaching and he looks around and says, is there any such thing as wrong mindfulness? And this friend of mine, told me that the students look at each other and nobody says a thing. <laughs> they don't know what to say. Finally, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh looks at them and he said, yes. And that prompted me to think a little more in depth and reflect on mindfulness and how people understand this word, how we understand it. What does it mean? And I, during the course of this lecture or talk, I'd like to explore with you some aspects of mindfulness. Now, the word mindfulness is an English word. It's a translation for a Buddhist word. The Pali version of that word is sati, which kind of means mindfulness, remembering the present, which is a very good way of expressing what mindfulness says, mind fully present. And I like to break it down in that way. The minds, the attention, the awareness fully in the present moment. However, there are many shades of this. Most people 
most of the time have some degree of mindfulness. I mean, if we were completely mindless, we wouldn't be able to find our way home. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to find our way to go to work. We wouldn't be able to function in life. We'd probably be dead by now because we would have been run over by a car or eaten by a tiger if we lived in the jungles. However, for most human beings, most of us today, live lives in which the conditions are quite safe, not only safe, but predictable, routine, familiar, which allows us to get by with very, very little attention, with very little presence of mind. So we get by with very little mindfulness. And what does that mean? That most of the time we are on automatic pilot and just going through the motions of living and quite often just habitual reprocessing of our past actions. So this is not mindful living. However, the human being by nature does have the capacity to wake up in the present moment. Every creature has that capacity. Otherwise, they would have not be in existence at this time. The capacity to wake up instinctually is part of life. It is the mechanism for self-preservation and self-gratification. And I'm going to go into this a little more. In addition to explaining this aspect of mindfulness, I'd like to explore a few other aspects. So what is mindfulness, that quality of mind? What does it come from? What, gener what is it generated by? How is it generated? What guidance or understanding informs that mindfulness? What is its purpose? If there is mindfulness, does it have a purpose? Does it have a goal, a direction? What is its strength, its power? And of course, I'm going to devote quite a bit of time this evening talking about mindfulness specifically within the Buddhist tradition and what it is for in that tradition. So what is mindfulness? I've already kind of explained it, the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. That is conscious, aware. More specifically, a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment, the mind fully present and conscious of the present moment experience. I often like to express it as a practice of remembering. We're not remembering something. We're remembering to be present. We're remembering the moment. And this is often used as a, a synonym for mindfulness, the practice of remembrance, remembering, bringing into being this quality of wakefulness. So this is something that is natural, as I said. Every human being has this, has this potential, but how much mindfulness is present in one's conscious existence. It is a mental factor or a quality of mind. You can think of it as an ingredient of consciousness, an ingredient of the mind. You can have more of it or less of it, just like in soup. You can put more salt in it or less salt in it, and sometimes no salt in it. And then you're completely unconscious and you're probably <laughs> are completely unaware when you're asleep, when you're really distracted. Most times there is always a little awareness there, a little mindfulness there. So it is a mental ingredient. It doesn't exist by itself. It is a natural state of the mind that can be present. It can be stronger or weaker. It can be cultivated to become more constantly present or 
by habit we can neglect it and so it becomes less and less available to us. So, for a lot of people, when I say the word mindfulness, the best example that I can give that will give you a taste of what it's like to be awake in the present is to compare with alertness. And alertness is very similar to mindfulness, but there are very important distinctions, differences. If mindfulness, this thing we call mindfulness, is generated, say, just the survival instinct. The survival instinct is the same for all living creatures. Self-gratification, self-preservation. You want to see something, uh, somebody who's really mindful in the sense of being present, awake. Just watch a wild animal, a deer, hears a noise. Head up, eyes open, ears up. That is the instinctual reaction when there is danger, any creature, humans as well. That is alertness. That is the mind fully present, awake in this moment, experiencing this moment fully. But it's generated from instinct, which is associated self-gratification, self-preservation, often fear or flight reaction. Always associated with a great deal of stress. It puts a lot of stress on the nervous system. And it is necessary for survival, but it cannot be and should not be maintained for long because it will do damage to the nervous system. And mentally, emotionally, people who are forced to be in this alert state for long periods of time because of danger or Fear will suffer from traumatic stress because it's, it's a actual damaging the nervous system. So that is one type of being awake. That's which alertness. Another aspect is that we can generate mindfulness, you know, force ourselves to be attentive through willpower, sheer will. Or there are other ways, and I'm going to speak about these other ways as well. There are skillful ways of making gentle effort to train oneself to become more at ease in the present until it becomes so effortless that it's an effortless enjoyment of the present moment. No stress. Survival and alertness. So, uh, as I said, alertness is similar to mindfulness in that it's a full attention to the present experience. However, it's always tinged by a tension, a stress, and it's generated from instinct, fight or flight reaction, and it's usually associated with some danger or some anticipation of a reward. I mean, the other time that an animal is very, very attentive and vigilant is like a, a tiger or a cat stalking its prey, completely attentive, alert, focused. Self-gratification can make you very alert. <laughs> so that's one this type of distinction that is very important. Alertness is not mindfulness, not in the sense that we want to cultivate. Alertness is necessary for survival. Fine. We can do better than that. We can be present, not because of danger, because of something we generate within ourselves. So when people try to do this, such as Buddhist monks or meditators, they often resort to the second way of generating mindfulness, uh, and that is willpower. 
Many, many people who undertake the practice of meditation are very committed and strive to tame that restless, wild stallion of a mind that won't slow down, won't be attentive, continually jumping about, restless or dullness. The Buddha, before he became Buddha, when he was still striving as a, an ascetic, we say a bodhisattva, somebody striving to become Buddha, relates some of his practices that he attempted before discovering the middle path, before finding the right approach that led to liberation, which he later called the Eightfold Path. He tried various ascetic practices and various meditation practices. This is one that he describes. I thought, you know, he's really determined. He's really keen. <laughs> Suppose that I, clenching my teeth and pressing my tongue against the roof of my mouth, were to beat down, constrain, and crush my mind with my awareness. That is, willpower, force my mind to concentrate and be attentive. So, clenching my teeth and pressing my tongue against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained, and crushed my mind with my awareness. As I did so, sweat poured from my armpits, and although tireless persistence was aroused, energy, vigor, effort, and unmuddled mindfulness established, he was alert. He was fully awake. <laughs> My body was aroused and uncalm because of the painful exertion. Through willpower, you can generate full awareness, strong awareness, and concentration, and it's miserable. <laughs> I can't confess to have done quite that, <laughs> but I do remember in my third year, actually, as a monk. And, you know, I'd been practicing for quite a long time. But I was practicing in a very austere environment. And I was not, you know, I was still training. I was not that skilled. One of the things that in the tradition that I belong to, there's a great reverence for austerity. Kanti paramang tapo titika is a saying that patient endurance will overcome all defilements. <laughs> like this, you know, really enduring hardship was thought to be really good. Be that as it may, one of the practices we did was to sit up every half moon night, every full moon and new moon night. In other words, one night a week, we did an all-night vigil when the idea was that we would sit in meditation or walk meditation. We would not lay down all night until the dawn of the next day when we went on arms around. And yeah, that's already quite a tough life. Uh, and uh, you get up at 3.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning in that monastery, and you're doing things all day. And then in the evening, you do chanting, and then maybe you get a cup of tea, and then you have to sit meditation one night a week. And I was really determined. So that year, I resolved that on these moon nights, during this vigil, when we finished our evening chanting, usually around 8 o'clock, 8.30, and we'd had, they usually gave us a cup of tea. After that, I would sit, and I would not get up. I would move my legs from side to side, either cross-legged or side posture, but I would not get up until the bell went in the morning, which was 3 a.m. So it's quite a long stretch. And of course, how can I do that? Through willpower. Will. I forced myself to stay awake. I forced myself to keep my eyes focused, my body up, my mind alert. And 
the first hour was difficult. But after the first hour or so, two hours, I was completely awake every time. I was so awake, my mind, there was no dullness. But there was a tremendous sense of this tightness, just like the Buddha said. I was alert, awake, my mind was right there, and yet there was no peace, no serenity. This is willpower can do this for you. You can concentrate, you can be mindful through willpower. This is how most of us have been taught to concentrate, through willpower. That's why whenever we say, concentrate on your work, and we do it, we are tired. And so if people meditate and then they feel tired, something is wrong with the way they're doing the meditation. Meditation is not hard work. It's less and less work, less and less effort, good meditation. Of course, to get there requires training. But willpower should be used very, very carefully, sparingly. It is not the path to serenity, peace, mindfulness, the right type of mindfulness. So be very wary of that. Mindfulness is being fully present, awake and aware of the conscious experience, but in a relaxed, calm, and peaceful state. It is the ability to take a deep interest in and engage fully with the experience of the present moment. And if it is done correctly, and as you develop the skill, it becomes effortless, but not only effortless and peaceful, it's blissful, because the mind is so awake. Life is so vibrant, that moment is so full of vibrancy. That is mindfulness, effortless. That's the, what we're aiming at. So it's less doing, Less and less doing, more and more being. Not to say that we can achieve this without some effort, but it has to be the right type of effort, gentle, skillful effort. Not bashing the mind, not crushing the mind, gently guiding the mind, encouraging the mind to take an interest, to relax in, to enjoy this moment peacefully enjoying this moment for what it is. Sometimes it's pleasant, sometimes it's not so pleasant. Most times it's just ordinary. But no moment is worthless because you can't have more than that. And you can't save your moments of life. This is the moment. You either live it or you lose it. So, we've seen what how is this mindfulness generated? That's very important. How is it brought into being, this quality of presence of mind? is very important. It can be skillful or unskillful, beneficial, harmful. Another very important thing regarding this quality of mindfully present is what guidance informs it? What understanding underpins it? You're fully present, but so what? <laughs> so you're fully present, okay, now what? <laughs> and this is the guidance of the Buddha, which is very important. Monks, just as the dawn is the forerunner and first indication of the rising of the sun, so is right view, the forerunner and first indication of wholesome states. In one of right view, right intentions arise. In one of right intention, right speech arises. In one of right speech, right action arises. In one of right action, right livelihood arises. 
in one of right livelihood, right effort arises. In one of right effort, right mindfulness arises. In one of right mindfulness, right concentration arises. In one of right concentration, right knowledge arises. In one of right knowledge, right deliverance, enlightenment. So this is actually the tenfold path that the Buddha taught. Most people are more familiar with the eightfold path, which then the Buddha taught as the way to practice in order to arrive at liberation, enlightenment. And here he only teaches the eight factors of the path. He leaves out the results, which is uh, right knowledge and right liberation. This is the path of cultivation. And often it's you know, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And he called it the noble eightfold path. So there are two words here I wish to stress, noble and right, which distinguishes it from other things. So this this was what the Buddha encouraged. And many of you have seen the Buddhist wheel that represents the eight fact, act factors of the Eightfold Path. I like this one, uh, not because it's so pretty, but because they've put mindfulness and concentration in a different order, which is a, a mistake, actually, <laughs> I think. But it does make a point that these factors are not a linear progression. They depend on each other and they influence each other and they don't exist in isolation. They all require each other to be a complete circle. So that right mindfulness depends on right view. So, is there such a thing as wrong mindfulness? What did the Buddha say? Monks, ignorance is the leader in the attainment of unwholesome qualities, followed by lack of conscience and lack of concern. Sometimes that's lack of remorse. In an, in an uninstructed person immersed in ignorance, wrong views arise. In one with wrong view, wrong intentions arise. In one of wrong intention, wrong speech arises. In one of wrong speech, wrong actions. In one of wrong actions, wrong livelihood. In one of wrong livelihood, wrong effort. And in one of wrong effort, wrong mindfulness arises. In one of wrong mindfulness, wrong concentration arises. So the Buddha definitely said there is wrong mindfulness, wrong concentration associated from the basic wrong understanding, wrong view, which leads to a completely different attitude to life, what we do, how we relate, what we aspire to, than a right view does. So the Buddha did not teach an ordinary Eightfold Path. He didn't say views, intention, speech, bodily action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, concentration. That's just an ordinary path. OK, develop views. OK, I'm going to develop my views. Develop intentions. OK, develop speech. Well, we've all got views. We've all got intentions, we all speak, we all act, we all earn a living. We all make effort, at least most of us, get out of bed, do things. We all have some degree of mindfulness to stay awake and go about our business. And we can all focus our attention sufficiently to do what we need to do. Pretty mundane doesn't lead us very far. In actual fact, if we start off with wrong view, we can be in great trouble. So following any Eightfold Path, 
just anything, based on our views and belief systems, everybody. We establish our intentions and goals. Everybody does that. We are vigilant and focusing our attention, make effort with those goals and objectives in mind. Everybody does that. We speak, we act, we engage with the world in the way that allows us to achieve those goals, which are based on our views and values. Now, that's pretty troubling. <laughs> Because many people have views and values and belief systems which are very, very bad. <laughs> and that leads them to have very, very bad intentions. And they go forth and implement all sorts of very, very harmful forms of speech, action, make great effort and apply themselves to achieve what they aspire to. Okay, what are these wrong views? And this is the Buddha's quote. And what is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. There is no fruit or result of good or bad actions. There is no this world, no next world, no mother, no father, no spontaneously reborn beings, no spiritual seekers who, practicing rightly, proclaim this world and the next. In other words, some uh, attainment, spiritual attainment, after having directly known and realized it for themselves. There are no spiritual beings of any real attainment. This is wrong view. Now, this is a little bit archaic. I mean, the Buddha spoke 2,600 years ago in northern India, and this is a translation of the Pali. But what is it saying is that wrong view is this attitude that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. And in particular, this is just this life, it's complete materialism. No respect for others. There's no result of good or bad. Put that away. Forget it. You just got to get what you want in this life. Either you look after yourself or nobody else will. And we don't have any re respect, regard, appreciation, gratitude for anyone else. There are people with such a view. Then there is no concern for anything more than just a material world, such as, you know, past lives, future lives, other realms of existence. There's no concern. It's the idea of spirituality or, or enlightenment. That's, that's just out there. Forget it. So if people have a view of this nature, what sort of values would they have? Where would the concern for others' well-being ever arise? Where would the concern for right or wrong, fair or not fair, just or not just, it wouldn't be a factor at all. What's the factor? Well, self-gratification, self-preservation is the primary factor, the instinctual default, if you wish, for living creatures. And some human beings definitely live at that level. Self-gratification, self-preservation but much worse than an animal. Animals don't have the intellect, the capacity to go to the extremes that humans can. Humans can be so much better than a wild animal. They can be so much worse because of their intellect and ability to scheme and plan and, and create much more opportunities to either do good or bad. So this wrong view, someone who's established in this kind of attitude towards life, guided by wrong view and wrong intention, one can still be mindful, yes, and strive with effort, yes, 
and get whatever it is that one wants and aspires to, yes, with little or no regard for the rights, feelings, and wishes of others. This can indeed be the case for a very, or it is the case, for a very, if you want to be a really successful thief or a killer, a charlatan, businessman, woman, politician, <laughs> and even so-called religious people. Wrong view brings into being wrong intentions. Wrong intentions will bring into being speech and action and way of living that can be extremely harmful. And they can be very, very good at achieving their goals. Make tremendous effort. Be extremely vigilant and mindful and very focused. It is very sad. It is very sad that and yet, it is the history of humanity. We see this. If we have the view, I hope I don't make anybody uncomfortable. As was historically the case in many cultures, black people are not really humans. Black people are not really humans. This is the you know, European attitude for a long time. You can walk into the land, they're not humans, you can kill them, take whatever you want, enslave them, sell them, their property, just like cattle, just like sheep. These are moral, what you would call so-called moral, upright religious people who had this view. I lived in Australia for a long time. Australia is a big continent, and there's a little island, Tasmania. Once the Australia was settled by the English, and after many number of years, in Tasmania, this little island, which is quite, you know, I don't know how many Aborigines were living in Tasmania at that time, but there would have been quite a number. There was a policy implemented by the government and by the settlers to go systematically from north to south of Tasmania and kill every single Aborigine, which they did. And they didn't feel any compulsion that it was anything wrong. It's just like going hunting for, I don't know, even when I say going hunting for deer, that sounds kind of cruel too. But for some people, that's a sport. They go hunting for deer. It's perfectly healthy, good. Recreation, based on the view that this is perfectly good to do and right to do. They become really, really good hunters. And they go out and so successfully kill many, many Aborigines, black people, maybe a different tribe, maybe a different community. Today, we would still see this. It is human failing from this wrong view, wrong belief, wrong value system springs the intention and then we can act in various atrocious ways horrific ways, much worse than an animal. A businessman, you think, well, what's important? Success, making money. How, that's my goal, is to become successful, make money, rich. What am I going to do? Uh, right, I'm intelligent, I'm clever, I'll say what I have to say, <laughs> I'll do what I have to do. I, I, it doesn't matter. Lie to your face, cheat, swindle. Just as long as I get more money, more success. How many people I hurt? Doesn't matter. And in order for me to really be successful, then I really have to be smart, 
very sharp, very focused, and put a lot of effort into it, and I could be successful. <laughs> so you, all those things. Well, maybe, you know, the, these are extremes. What about the good man? The good person, the ordinary good person. Well, I respect other people's feelings. I respect their rights. I don't want to, you know, I, I want to be honest and truthful. I don't really want to, you know, kind of outrightly hurt people. <laughs> but I kind of like to be successful too, and I want to get stuff and be rich too. So I go out. You know, my intention is still to make money, but I'm going to do it in a somewhat moral way. I'm not going to cheat, lie, steal. I'm going to try and live, uh, work for it. I'm going to make effort. But I'm kind of going to get it for myself <laughs> and accumulate you know, as much as possible for myself and my family. That, we'd say that's, that's a good person, but it's kind of a greedy person, <laughs> a good greedy person. And to a certain extent, that's pretty normal. So you can see where I'm getting at. Depending on our values, our views, our intentions, is what's going to shape what we bring into the world. Mindfulness is not the biggest thing. Because we will be mindful and vigilant, but maybe be doing some pretty horrible things. That's why the Buddha taught the Noble Eightfold Path, not just any Eightfold Path. He taught one which was right view. It's based on right understanding, so that there'll be right intentions, what we intend to do with our lives, our values. And we will speak and act accordingly and apply ourselves with the right sort of effort and the right sort of mindfulness and the right sort of concentration. And this right view, it, you know, just really one of the fundamental things is an understanding of the law of karma, that there is such a thing as good and bad. There are consequences to our actions that we are responsible for what we create, that what we do doesn't only affect ourselves, it impacts other people, and it will have consequences not only now, but also later on in the future. And so this was the Buddha's kind of explanation of the law of karma. We are the owners of our actions, the heirs of our actions. We spring, we come forth from our past actions. We're, we're tied to our karma. We're supported by our karma. And whatever we do, good or bad, of that we will be the heirs. We will inherit that. That is what our inheritance is. And it's not just this life and not just now. It's also, right view is also beginning to understand the interconnectedness of all life, that it's, you're, you don't live in isolation, and your happiness cannot be at the expense of everyone else's. Also an appreciation for the limitation of sense pleasures, that happiness and pleasure are not the same thing, that having a lot or just seeking pleasure is not necessarily the happiness or the path to happiness. Having some, at least, some recognition that there is a, a possibility of spiritual unfolding, spiritual growth, that that is our true potential. And having some inkling of what the path to this liberation could be. And that is a great blessing to have received guidance. That's why education is so important. What belief systems, what values are instilled in children is very, very important. In this area, religion has done great harm and it can do great good.
society has done great harm and it can do great good. In other words, many of the beliefs and belief systems that are inculcated in the human mind at an early age is what shapes their attitude towards life. If they're taught that it's all right to cheat and lie and steal and kill and do bad things because it doesn't matter, they'll do it. If they're taught that that, that nationality, they're not human, they'll hate them. And that's what every monster teaches the sheep that follow them. Now, if we are established in some basis of right view, from that it is inevitable that the, the direction of our life, the intention, the purpose for our life, will incline towards a degree of these things. The Buddha called them the right intentions of renunciation. This counteracts greediness, the idea of getting more and more for myself. This is the way to happiness. <laughs> the ability to say, oh, I've got enough. The ability to share. The ability to rejoice in other people's having things rather than me having to have it all. <laughs> The intention of goodwill, recognizing the feelings of others are is just as important as the, your feelings. And really having some empathy, really having some uh, goodwill, friendliness towards others, in that you respect them. And the intention of not harming, not applying cruelty not bringing cruelty into this world. So this is our, if you wish, our higher aspiration in life. Once we have a right view, once we've been educated in the right way, once we've been guided by wise people in the right direction, rather than by really, really bad teachings. Now, when we have that sort of foundation of right view and right intention, this will have an impact. This is what informs mindfulness. This is what right mindfulness is. Right mindfulness is informed. It is in educated by that right view and right intention. So mindfulness is not just being aware. As sometimes people say, bare awareness. It's like voting, you voted for a, a senator. You voted for the senator, he's elected, he goes to the Senate. He's extraordinarily diligent, he's extraordinarily punctual, attends every single meeting of the Senate, and not only that, he's there to represent you. And every time a bill comes up for a vote, he stands up proudly, present and sits down. What was the bill about, Mark? Is that the sort of representative you want to have? What was that bill useful? Was that law going to take, kill people? What is, what is that going to, he's present, he's, he's there. That's bare awareness, present. Doesn't do much. <laughs> So, mindfulness is not just being aware, or being awake, or being fully conscious of what's occurring around you. Mindfulness also guides the awareness to specific areas, remembers the instructions of right view and right intentions, and initiates a response. In other words, it's proactive. You're there for a purpose. <laughs> In a simile, the Buddha used mindfulness like, described mindfulness like a person who guards a door or a gate. Just as the royal frontier fortress has a gatekeeper, wise, experienced, and intelligent, to keep out those he doesn't know and to let in those he does, 
for the protection of those within and to ward off those without. In the same way, a disciple of the noble ones is endowed with mindfulness, highly meticulous, remembering and able to call to mind even things that were done and said long ago. With mindfulness as his gatekeeper, the disciple of the noble ones abandons what is unwholesome, develops what is wholesome, abandons what is blameworthy, develops what is blameless, and looks after himself with purity. So this mindfulness is not just present, it's present with, it's intelligent. It's, it remembers, it has right view, right intention to guide it as to how to respond, how to move forward. And so from this right mindfulness, or with this right mindfulness, right effort can be made. And right effort, the Buddha said, is basically making the effort to prevent, just like the gatekeeper, prevent unwholesome things from taking over one's mind. If they have taken over, get rid of them. Encourage wholesome things to take, come into one's mind. If they've come into one's mind, to keep them alive develop them. So one can apply mindfulness and effort then. Guided by right view and right intention, we are mindful and strive with effort to cultivate. See, now this is how you apply the mindfulness and the effort. What are you going to use it for? You're going to look after your speech, your body, your actions, the way you live, the way you relate, the way you put yourself out in the world to cultivate that which is wholesome and good and to abandon that which is unwholesome and bad. And so right view, right intention, then with this mindfulness is the guard at the door that looks after our speech to make it right speech, looks after our actions to make it right actions, looks after our livelihood, to make it right livelihood. And I'm going to move through these quite quickly because most people are quite familiar with these uh, teachings in Buddhism. Right speech is abstaining from lying, abstaining from divisive speech, malicious backbiting, just to tear people apart and make them an antagonistic towards each other, just for the fun of it or to your advantage. Abstaining from abusive and harsh speech. Abstaining from idle chatter, that, that idle chatter that just clutters the airwaves. The Buddha said that a speech, a good speech is endowed with these five factors. It is spoken at the right time. It is spoken in truth. It's the truth. It is spoken affectionately. It is spoken when it's of benefit. It is spoken with a mind of goodwill. If only we could use our mindfulness and make effort to guard our speech and cultivate this beautiful way of speaking, our relationships and the society as a whole would be so much more pleasant, harmonious. Right action. Right action, what we do with our bodies. One abstains from taking of life and dwells scrupulous, merciful, and compassionate for the welfare of all beings. And this applies to all forms of life. But in particular, human beings, <laughs> if everyone could keep this one thing, abstaining from killing other human beings, dwelling with compassionate and with an attitude of well, uh, goodwill towards others. This would be heaven on earth. One abstains from taking what is not given, stealing, abstains from sexual misconduct. So this is applying mindfulness to guard over our actions, you know, how we present ourselves to the world, how we relate. We're going to try and live 
harmless, we're not going to kill, we're not going to exploit and hurt others or other creatures. We're not going to steal that, you know, it's, we're not going to just exploit sexually other people for pleasure. And in this way, with mindfulness and effort, we guard ourselves and cultivate a virtuous life. Right life, well, we live in the world, we've got to earn a living. The Buddha did actually go into great detail uh, about the trade that you should follow. However, he said to avoid uh, dealing in weapons and avoid trading, I should say, dealing in human beings. It means avoiding trading in humans in any form whatsoever. <laughs> not dealing in meat, not dealing in intoxicants, and not dealing in poisons. I mean, these are things that hurt and harm others. So we want to get away from that trade, that way of earning a living. There's so many other opportunities to earn a living that allow us to live virtuous and compassionate lives. So now, Once we have that foundation of right view, we have the intention, the direction for our life. We have the mindfulness and the effort and we train ourselves in right speech, right action, right livelihood. We are what you would call a good person. You can feel confident, you can feel comfortable with yourself. You're not racked by remorse and guilt or shame, you, you're doing your best. You may not be perfect, but you're trying and you're doing your best. And you can feel a degree of comfort in life and within yourself. And because you are able to be comfortable within yourself, you will be able to undertake a more systematic training of the mind in meditation. It is extremely difficult to meditate if you don't like to be with yourself. If you don't like to, what you see within yourself. That is why one of the hindrances is remorse and guilt. That will, meditation doesn't go very far with that. So guided by right view and right intention and well established in virtue, we, we feel comfortable, we feel, we respect ourselves. We further refine the power of mindfulness and make the necessary effort to reduce the power of the hindrances in order to cultivate refined states of mind in meditation. Five hindrances. Why are we not enlightened? I like to put that forth quite often. There are amongst these five hindrances which cause blindness, lack of vision, and non-knowledge, which prevent insight, are associated with pain and do not lead to Nibbana or Nirvana, liberation. Why are we not enlightened? Because of these five hindrances. And they are easy to remember. One, Preoccupation with sense pleasures, the sense desire. Preoccupation with ill will, wanting to get rid of everything you don't like. Dullness and sleepiness and laziness, sloth and torpor. Restlessness and worry, the agitated hyperactive mind. Worry sometimes better rendered as remorse. Things that you've done that you feel guilty about will haunt you. And the last one, skeptical doubt. Yeah, I don't think I can. I don't know what, I don't. I, sometimes I call these like the, the, the four Ds, demanding, defending, distraction, doubting. <laughs> this is either we're preoccupied with demanding what we want out of life defending what we've got and fighting off uh, what we don't like, 
distracting ourselves with whatever is out there just to clutter our minds, TV, radio, music, <laughs> and all the countless other distractions in the world. And, and the doubting mind, the mind that, well, I don't really know about this Eightfold Path. I don't know about, you know, it's, it's probably nobody has been enlightened for a long time. It's probably not possible. So we don't do anything. As long as the mind is crippled by these hindrances, it's, these are veils that weaken our ability to see and penetrate to reality. Our mindfulness, the clarity and presence of mind will be hindered. The focus of our attention will be clouded. That's why we don't see truth. That's why we're not enlightened. The truth doesn't belong to anyone. It's not a secret. Didn't go away when the Buddha passed away didn't belong to him. The truth is the way things are. That's how he, he called it. Knowledge and vision of things as they are. They're always like that. Why don't we see it? Well, because of these five hindrances. <laughs> what is the Buddhist meditation practice is to systematically train the mind to weaken these, the power of these hindrances. They're always present to some degree in normal life, but they do become very, very noticeable when you try to meditate. However, through the systematic training of the mind by the various meditation techniques taught, not only in Buddhism, but in many other traditions as well, gentle effort, to arouse mindfulness, learning to sustain mindfulness in a way that encourages the mind to relax into the present moment with contentment, not through willpower. And as it learns to do that, especially with a meditation object, such as the natural flow of the breath, it could be something else, it begins to enjoy being present, resting with this moment, and it begins to collect and embrace the object of meditation. And so that's how the concentration builds up. It becomes increasingly still, increasingly quiet, withdraws from the sensory world, and finds a deep peace and stillness within and that is the path that leads the mind to a clarity and a purity where the hindrances are temporarily subdued. When the mind is temporarily freed from the hindrances through right concentration, it is fit for the task of penetrating the veil of delusion and having direct knowledge and vision of things as they really are. That is the, the terminology that the Buddha used. Yatha buddha jnana The arising of the knowledge and vision of things as they are. When the mind is freed from those hindrances, it is fit to see. Why are we not enlightened? <laughs> Maybe the hindrances are getting in the way. Maybe we're too preoccupied with demanding, defending, distracting, and doubting. Maybe we have to do something about that. And we can. But each according to their inclination, ability, and possibility. Whenever people ask me about meditation and they say, well, how long will it take? I say, there are only two factors that <laughs> matter, is what you bring into it and what you put into it. What we bring into it is our conditioning. I mean, where we are at now is the only place we can start 
And each one of us is slightly at different stages of maturity in our spiritual path. And then what we put into it is how much effort are we willing to make, how much commitment, how much time, how interested are we in cultivating this path. That is a choice for each of us to make. But the path is there and liberation is possible. Not only affirmed by the Buddha during his lifetime, but many disciples over the millennia and even outside of Buddhism. We hear of mystics who speak about this transcendent liberation. In one of right concentration, the mind that is fit for the task, right knowledge arises. In one of right knowledge, right deliverance arises. So my friends, that is an overview <laughs> of mindfulness. So is there anything wrong with mindfulness? Well, it does depend on what you mean. But if we understand the context, this quality of mindfulness, it is a necessary quality in order for the possibility of spiritual growth. However, it has to be right mindfulness. And that requires the context, it doesn't exist in isolation. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity this evening. Um, I, I like to speak about these topics because I feel passionate about them and I'm, it inspires me. I hope it is at least of some value to you. It is just my reflection, it's not gospel. Uh, of course, you may not agree and others may not agree, but it's meant to be a reflection whereby we then consider it, think about it, what's useful in it. If there is something useful, good. Thank you so much for giving me your time.